Hi, students. Uh, we're going to talk this week, week five, about sensation, perception, and attention. Okay. All right. Let me make this a little bigger so you can see the full screen. Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about um, psychology of adult development in terms of these, you know, essential cognitive processes, um, we know that there are kind of decrements, I guess, across the lifespan, across the adult lifespan uh, concerning these. Now, there are four kind of basic cognitive mechanisms that um, researchers talk about in adult um, development research. Uh, the first is processing speed, how fast your brain processes information and, you know, sensational kinds of uh, stimuli, and also how you attend to um, <clears throat> those things that we process in our minds. And so if you think of uh, processing speed, you're thinking of kind of the architecture that's up here in the brain, um, how well it functions, how fast it functions, how well your neurons fire, right? When you're presented with some kind of uh, uh, stimulus, okay? And so you're talking about kind of the building uh, blocks in your brain and how well they function, okay? And you can think that uh, processing speed kind of decreases over time uh, in the adult lifespan. It's good you know, when you're um, <clears throat> in an emerging adulthood and, and young adulthood, and then it kind of slows as you move through middle age and older adulthood. You can think of it in that way. The second, uh, basic cognitive mechanism that we might think about is uh, sensory processing, okay? In other words, and I'm gonna talk about that in more depth, but uh, how well you bring in kind of the physical wavelengths of light and the physical wavelengths of sound and the chemicals that come in that we smell, um, et cetera, in terms of taste also, um, and how well our uh, sensory function uh, processes that information, okay? Again, you can think of kind of a, I don't know, a decline over time. It's kind of good in uh, emerging adulthood and, and younger adulthood, and then it kind of uh, <clears throat> decreases in middle age and older adulthood, but there are individual differences in this area. In other words, you know, some uh, middle-aged and older adults can see and hear and taste and smell, right, uh, really well compared to others in their, in their age group. And you can also think of younger adults and emerging adults who um, are not as good um, at picking up visual and, and hearing stimuli and things like that, okay? So there are big individual differences between each of these um, uh, developmental periods across the adult uh, lifespan, okay? Now, the third basic cognitive mechanism uh, is inhibition, okay? That has to do with your attentional processes. How well, let's say you're in a cafeteria, you know, maybe a buffet somewhere, and you're sitting down with uh, an older adult and you're having a conversation and there are kind of trays being slapped down on tables and, and there's other conversations going on around you. And, uh, you know, there are forks and spoons and knives that are being clanked around right in the, in the dining room. And you have to kind of uh, inhibit that irrelevant uh, stimuli in order to concentrate on the conversation that we're having, okay? And sometimes an older adult will compensate uh, for their hearing loss by looking at your lips as you speak, okay? And so in a heavily uh, uh, auditory kind of stimulation where everything is kind of loud around you, 
Uh, maybe if you have reduced ability to hear things, you will start to look at the lip area, okay? To kind of lip read what the other person is trying to say. And, you know, sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't if we're older adults, okay? In that kind of a, an environment. And so uh, inhibition is the ability to inhibit or stop irrelevant kinds of information from coming into our attention our attentional spotlight, I guess, uh, and kind of concentrate or focus on what we really want to attend to, and that is the conversation that we're having, okay? All right, the fourth cognitive mechanism, and we'll talk about that next week, is called working memory. It's part of your memory systems, okay? And so we won't talk about that today, but we are going to talk about the first three, you know, processing speed, uh, sensory function, and inhibition in this lecture, okay? All right, so we know we are all kind of individually different across the lifespan in the various periods, emerging adulthood, young adulthood, middle age, and older adulthood in terms of sensory functioning, okay? Uh, here on this slide, it says sensation, perception, and attention are cognitive processes. And I just talked about that, okay? Cognitive psychology is a study of mental processes. So you can think of mental reactions to stimuli or mental operations in general as being cognitive in nature, okay? So you can think of decision-making or problem-solving or language use, the use of words and grammar, right? You can think of your sensory processes um, and memory. And memory is a big uh, part of cognitive processes, okay? So these are all things that go on in our head and their mental processes. It says here in younger adulthood, many individuals have sensory systems that are normal, but there, as I said before, are individual differences in sensory functioning, okay? Some people use glasses, even from childhood, right? To kind of correct their vision and be able to take in visual stimuli. Uh, and some people, even children, use a hearing aid, right? When they can't hear too well. So that's a way of compensating for, for having hearing loss, okay? So we can have, you know, uh, differences in sensory functioning even from childhood through adulthood, okay? And we use various uh, props like uh, glasses or contacts or hearing aids, right? To be able to compensate and pick up information from the outside world, okay? Now your book says changes in sensory functioning usually, usually occur gradually, okay? from middle adulthood through older adulthood, um, and changes in perceptual processing also occur during that period. But that's for people who don't have any kind of environmental, um, you know, uh, caused or internally caused losses in these areas, okay? And they could be even come during childhood, right? Um, so we want to ask, what is sensation and what is perception? Okay, let's talk about that next. Now, uh, usually when you talk about sensation and I'm teaching it, I'll usually talk about vision first because, um, you know, this is a primary research area in uh, sensation, okay, or sensory processes. So you can look in the book and they have a section on vision uh, and it talks about changes in visual sensory functioning across adulthood, but what does it, how does it work, okay? In vision, we take in physical wavelengths of light on a very narrow kind of a spectrum called visible light. And you can see that in this, uh, in this chart below uh, this bullet point. Uh, you know, we can't see ultraviolet uh, wavelengths. We can't see infra infrared wavelengths, right? The human system is only attuned to the vis visible light spectrum right there, okay? 
And so we take in physical wavelengths of light and they're called light waves. And we have particular cells that are on the back of our eye on the retina, okay, called cones and rods that pick up these physical wavelengths of light. And then our brain kind of transforms uh, that energy, that physical energy into something that the brain can understand, okay? And so our cones and rods act as the sensory receptors that uh, are called transducers, okay? They, they change physical wavelengths into something that the brain can understand. And they change those physical wavelengths into neural or neuron impulses, okay? And those go to the back of our head, right? Our optical system, our visual processing system is in the back of our head, okay? Uh, rods are shaped like rods and that's why they're called rods. They uh, are longer than cones, which are shaped like cones, all right? So they're very aptly named, I guess, right? Rods allow us to pick up light, okay? And so we can pick up anything from black in the night to uh, light in the daytime, right? And we can pick up anything in between in terms of the black-white spectrum. So you'll get some grays in there, right? Uh, older adults have problems with rods sometimes when they're adapting to the dark, okay? Let's say that an older adult lives in an apartment and it's a dark apartment, but they're coming from the very bright light outside. They come inside and they might even fall because they can't kind of adapt to this new dark kind of an environment, okay? So rods are in charge of that, okay? If you wake up in the middle of the night and you think you see something crawling in the corner of your room, right? A monster or something, you know, we're picking up information through our rods in that darkened environment in order to make some sense of what's going on, right? It may all be up here in our mind, or there could really be a monster there in your corner. I'm, I'm just joking, right? But rods pick up that kind of information. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in terms of cones, we have three different kinds of cones. Uh, they pick up red, green, and blue, okay? And any combination between those. And so that's how we see colors, okay? Cones are, are color uh, transmitters or color sensory receptors, okay? We don't have a whole lot of cones as uh, compared to rods. We have rods all the way across the retina, okay? Except in the center, the fovea. But we have lots and lots of cones kind of in the center of the retina, okay? And that's where colors, our color vision takes place, right? So the bottom point on this slide says, although studies show obvious, obvious differences between younger and older adults on visual function, there's lots of evidence that we have individual differences, okay? In all of those time periods, developmental periods, uh, because older adults in some samples show really, really good vision, and then some don't, okay? And so I read an article by Owsley um, on visual sensation and differences in the ability of adults to, you know, go through life and have good vision or poor vision. All right, let's talk about hearing. This is usually second in, in uh, kind of a lecture on uh, sensation. Now, hearing is very important to us, okay? Um, as well as vision, right? Um, we've kind of evolved to be able to look for threats in the environment and also hear threats in the environment, okay? And that's why we have these systems. Uh, we're able to communicate with one another because we're human. Uh, the way to communicate is both visually, where we see you uh, talking or you know, doing nonverbal kinds of behaviors, or we hear you, okay? We hear your language. And so in hearing, we're also taking in sound waves, okay? 
and process those in an intricate auditory system, which has evolved to allow us to hear varying degrees of loudness and also pitch, okay? Now, we have in, in our inner ear, and it's shown down here at the bottom, some things called hair cells. And those hair cells are our sensory receptors for sound, okay? They're located on a little snail-shaped device in the inner ear called the cochlea, all right? And these hairs are kind of shown on the right-hand side of the slide in a mouse hair, okay? Uh, that's been dissected. And you can see that they're kind of arranged from the lower pitch hairs in the very innermost part of the cochlea in a spiral all the way to the uh, hair cells that pick up high pitches, okay? Now, when we hear a sound or a noise, hair cells will bend, okay? And that's the way they kind of energize the neurons that correspond to each hair cell. Uh, the hair cells that pick up low pitches, if you ever looked inside a piano, you see strings that are really thick, okay? And those play low pitches on a piano, right? Uh, also in our inner ear, we have some kind of thick hair cells that are concentrated right at the center of the cochlea, and they pick up the low pitched sounds. Okay, and of course, as you go around the spiral, the hair cells become uh, kind of thinner and thinner until you get to the very thin hair cells uh, kind of on the outside of the spiral, and those pick up the high-pitched sounds, okay? If you think about this, um, in older adulthood, what do you think breaks down first, okay? in terms of hair cells. Would it be the thick hair cells that pick up the low pitches or would it be the thin hair cells that pick up the high pitches, okay? Think about that, all right? Um, if you ever played guitar, which string breaks uh, first, <laughs> okay, usually? It's usually that very thin one, right? Okay, and so we may have deterioration of our um, high end or a high frequency hair cells first, okay? And so we can still hear low pitches when we're older adults, but those higher pitch sounds kind of are harder to hear because we have deterioration in those sensory receptors for hearing. All right, we talk about sensation. Now, of course, we bring in these wavelengths and you know we have sensory receptors that kind of transduce the energy into something the brain can understand. But how do we understand it, okay? That's where perception comes in. That's the second step in sensory perception. In perception, we use top-down processes based on experience, okay? If I'm uh, sitting on the ocean shore in the sand in a chair somewhere, and I'm looking out into the ocean, uh, and I see way out in the distance somewhere some dome-shaped uh, thing that's passing by, I could just by experience, <coughs> excuse me, think that that may be <coughs> a ship, right? But it's it's dome shaped, so why would that be a ship, right? We could think of it as a vessel, but we could also think of it as some kind of an animal that has a, a dome shape, like a whale, right? Or a dolphin, or even a sea turtle, right? Out in the distance. And so we can kind of make good uh, guesses about what that thing might be based in our perceptual system. It's a top down process based on experience, okay? We experience kind of, uh, I don't know, cyclical things that happen to us across our lives. And we're able to make sense of those things just based on our past experiences, okay? So perception um, is big on top-down processes where we, we make guess, guesses about what we're seeing or hearing, okay? Uh, so, perception is the process of organizing, recognizing, and interpreting the sensory information that we take in, okay? 
and our perceptual, perceptual processes uh, depend on uh, our memory systems, right? We, we need to remember past experiences in order to understand and interpret what we're seeing or hearing or tasting even, right? Uh, and so it also depends on, you know, what environment are we in? where we're making guesses about what things are that are ambiguous, okay? It also depends on attentional processes, okay? Maybe there are lots of things going on out here in the environment uh, that we're trying to interpret, and we need to kind of focus on what's the most important thing, okay? Let's say we're being threatened, okay? And so this person has a gun, God forbid, right? Uh, but what would we focus on? We would focus on the weapon. Okay? There's something called a weapon focus in studies in psychology and the law. Okay? People won't remember the perpetrator's face, but they will remember the weapon because it's right there. And it's the, you know, the highest threat to you. right? And so our attentional processes kind of guide our perceptions as well. All right, I just mentioned attention. Uh, William James, way back in the late 1800s, talked about attention and wrote about attention as a mental spotlight, okay? We shine our little mental spotlight on various things in our environment and we pay attention to it, okay? We might not even have our eyes open, right? We might be laying on the couch with our eyes closed we still have this mental uh, spotlight and we're shining it on thoughts that we're having or fantasies that we have in our head or memories that we're thinking about, okay? So this spotlight directs our efforts to process some portion of the outside or inside stimulation that we're receiving, okay? So in important uh, concepts that are written about in the book or in attentional resources, you, know, um, you might think of how much money do we have right now, right, in the bank. Those are resources, right? But these are attentional resources. How much uh, attentional resources do we have to spend on uh, what's going on in the environment? It's limited, okay? We also have an attentional capacity. How much stuff can we that we're bombarded with at all times can we pay attention to? All right, and earlier at the very beginning of the lecture, I talked about inhibition. How do we inhibit things that are irrelevant to what we're shining our spotlight on? Okay. Either visually or hearing or taste or touch, right? Okay, in your book, read about the theories of attention because those are important. I have a couple of links here. They're very interesting, actually, um, especially the inattentional blindness demonstration. I think you'll enjoy that one. But this uh, first link talks about the different types of attention. Okay, and that second one is the one that's entertaining. It's about a gorilla, <laughs> okay? All right, so one thing to think about, you know, before you take your quiz, think about how attentional resources and attentional capacity might change across adulthood, okay? You think an older adult has as much of an attention, uh, attentional focus uh, as a younger adult might, okay? Think about those things. That is all for this week, isn't that amazing? Okay, so I appreciate your time, and I hope I didn't go too long with this lecture, but uh, it's good to uh, talk about these things because I enjoy them, okay? All right, I'll see you next week. Do your stuff uh, that's on the tentative course schedule and get those things done and catch up with any work that you haven't done yet, okay? All right, I've enjoyed your discussion uh, posts. And I'll continue to enjoy them, I'm sure. Okay. All right. Bye-bye until next week.